remember why Jesus died for us. And for my portion, is for he did to redeem. Jesus gave us his love, blessings, word, perfect presence, and his life to redeem. Colossians 1, verses 13 to 14 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his, I mean, of the son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. Isaiah 47, 4 says, Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, his name, the Holy One of Israel. So we know that Jesus came to redeem us for our sins. In fact, he is often referred to as the great redeemer. However, what does redeem or redemption mean? Well, redemption is defined as the act of making something better or more acceptable, the act of redeeming or atoning for fault or mistake. It can mean deliverance, rescue, salvation. It can also mean atonement for guilt, the act of exchanging something for money, and lastly, the act of saving people from sin and evil. But the question is, where did this need for redemption start? Why do we need redemption? Because we obviously do, and we did. And how did Jesus, our great redeemer, bring our redemption? Well, based on the definition of redemption, the act of saving people from sin and evil, the origin of sin must start with the first sin and the entrance of evil into the world. Now, because I'm not as gifted as some of these other brothers that are going to speak today, such as Brother Charles and Brother Greg, um, I figured for me, probably the best thing is to have a, a video and explain the beautiful story of the Bible and the redemption that Jesus came to redeem us from. So the story begins with Adam and Eve in the beautiful Garden of Eden. And as we know, in the garden, there was the tree of forbidden fruit, which God told Adam and Eve to not eat. Because if they did, they would die. But then the serpent appeared and deceived Eve by telling her that if she ate the fruit, they would become like God. Now this is when, as we know, the first thing occurred. Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they were disobedient to God, and they showed a lack of faith in the goodness of God by not trusting his word, because they believed that if they ate the fruit, they would not die. And because of their fall, we know that they broke their trust with God, saw each other in shame for the first time, were removed from the Garden of, sin, the garden of Eden, and sin entered the world. See, at that time, it was the serpent, but we know that it was Satan. And it was the introduction of evil into the world. And the worst part about Satan is that he has the ability to corrupt the hearts of man and tempts them into the sin which leads to all transgressions, take us away from God. He did then, and he still does it now. But when all hope seemed lost, we know that God always has a plan. And he says it in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In this verse, God was talking to Satan and he mentioned her seed. Now, as we know, this was the first indication of Jesus in the Bible. But at that time, they did not know who the seed would be. All that was known was that the seed was going to come and bruise Satan's head. But Satan would bruise his heel. So the question was, who would this person be? And from what lineage would this great person come to hurt Satan? And exactly what did the bruising of the head and bruising of the heel mean? Well, as we know, as the Bible progresses in Genesis, that it starts with Abraham. Now, we know that Abraham was obedient to God. And God set a covenant with Abraham. And on multiple occasions, God told Abraham that he and his offspring we blessed and bring blessings into the world. Another indication of Jesus. Genesis 12, 3 says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
And Genesis 22, 18 says, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. We know that God's covenant will eventually lead to the land of Israel. And we know that the blessings that God gave Abraham was great. And of course, we know that God, always, like always, kept his promise and his covenant. And it was prophesied to Judah, Abraham's great-grandson, from Jacob in Genesis 49, 8 and 12, where it said that it would be a rule of 12 nations, and the seed will come from his line. Now, this was the first indication of this person coming and being a great king. And it also gave an indication that this king will redeem the sin of Adam and Eve. So the question continues, who would this king be, and who will rise and bring prosperity of this great magnitude? As we know, then David became king. Some believe that maybe David would be the one to bring redemption. He was saw as a hero. He won many battles. So many thought that he was the one that could bruise the snake's head. But we know that David, unfortunately, David was not the seed that would bring redemption. Because his heart did not remain pure, but he did Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. And when all hopes seem lost, we know that God always comes through. And he said that the seed would come from his line. But we know that David's line would fell short too, with Solomon and his hundreds of wives and their love for wealth and, in some cases, idolatry. And because of this, the kingdom of Israel falls to Babylon. And, the kingdom, and with no kingdom, there was no more kings, and therefore unfulfillment, potential unfulfillment of the prophecy. But then the prophets start speaking, right? And specifically, the prophet Isaiah brings up the hope of the future king from the line of David and connects it to the ancient promises, promise of Genesis 3.15. Isaiah 53, 3-5 says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted, I'm sorry, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And then 10 through 12 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make, him, make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By, the knowledge, by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear the iniquities. Therefore, for I will divide him a portion with the great, and shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he numbered with transgressions and bore the sin of many, and made the intercession from the transgressors. Now what Isaiah was saying here was that the king was going to come, but he wasn't necessarily going to be this great king that everybody was thinking. He was going to be one that was despised and one that would be stricken. And they come to find out that maybe the bruising would be, would be Jesus when he comes, right? But he would come back and cure our hearts and redeem us for the sins that we've done. And then the Old Testament ends, right? But the New Testament comes. And then this is when we know that Jesus comes. And we know that Jesus will be the seed because he will rise and he will take down Satan and defeat Satan. Because he was from the lineage of David, Judah, and Abraham. And he came here to redeem humanity. And as we know, Jesus goes forth preaching the goodness of God's kingdom, teaching God's word, performing miracles and healing, saying that he is the son of God and the great redeemer. However, as we know, Jesus spoke more and more. And he started telling his disciples that he was going to suffer and die. Matthew 16, 21 says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests and scribes and be killed, and rise the third day. See, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, they didn't know this at the time, he was explaining the fulfillment of the, of, the heel, of, of the bruising of the heel. 
And as we know, when Jesus goes to Jerusalem, he's giving a crown, a robe. God's kingdom is mocked, and he's exalted not on the throne as he should be, but on the cross on the day that we today consider Good Friday. And it seems at that time, unfortunately, with the bruising of the heel that Satan potentially could have potentially won. But we know that's not the case, right? Because God always comes through. On the third day, which we consider Easter Sunday, he was resurrected and he rose from his tomb, providing the ultimate proof that he came as the great redeemer for us. And when he did this, he was essentially fulfilling the prophecy that was always from the beginning that he was going to sacrifice himself for our transgressions to heal us from the evils of Satan so we may be forgiven for our sins and redeem us through salvation, thus bruising the head of the serpent. Amen. Hebrews 9, 11, and 12 puts it perfectly. But when Christ appeared as the high priest, of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. It is said that one of the worst gifts of mankind is our amazing ability of self-destruction. However, the beauty of God is that he loves and forgives us no matter what and is willing to redeem us for all our flaws. Although sin entered the earth through the evil of Satan and the fall of Adam and Eve, Jesus came to provide salvation from transgressions that we have done when the devil surrounded the world in our hearts. Therefore, on this day, Good Friday, and every day, we must remember that Jesus came and suffered for us for it was God's word that the snake head was to be bruised only if the seed hill was bruised. And because he knew that the, the path of eternal redemption, he knew that that was the path of eternal redemption and that we would be bought, leading back to the definition of redemption, with the blood of Jesus. And because of this, we must remember the R for redemption and honor for our great redeemer, Jesus Christ. Thank you. I can so-
high I can search the earth below But there's no one but Jesus Jesus Father in heaven, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for the finished work of the cross. We thank you for our salvation. And predominantly at this time, I want to thank you for the reconciliation, and the work that was done on the cross. I pray and ask that you would be honored by all that is said and done here today, that your name would be magnified, that you would be pleased with all aspects of this service as you are truly, as our sister sang, worthy. And Lord, I ask this in the name of my kinsman, Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. I need my glasses. It is Good Friday, and for those of us who are saved, quite often we go through our lives, our days, our weeks, and we think about our salvation, and we think about the fact that we are saved. And while that's really good and fine and great that we're saved, and I don't mean to belittle it at all, God's plan wasn't just to save us. There was a lot more to it than just saving us. And so the passage I'm going to read from today is found in Romans chapter 5, if you want to turn there. And for now, we're going to read 5, 9 through 11, which reads as following. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received this reconciliation. Salvation, being saved, isn't all that happened on Calvary. God's plan wasn't just to save us. It was ultimately to reconcile us. And I guess the best illustration I can give is this. If I'm walking down the street and there's a burning building there and there's a child inside, I go in there, get through the flames, grab the child, pull the child out, set the child on the curb where they're safe, and then I just keep walking, letting the child there, you know, covered with soot and dirty and alone and scared and all those things. That child's saved from the flames. But that wasn't what God wanted to do. It was more like this scenario. Walking down the street, the building's on fire, hear the screams of this child who's being surrounded. Go in, pull the child out, take the child back to my place, clean him off, provide some protection, give him some security, bring him into a relationship, prepare them for the future, teach them put up a college fund for their future, <laughs> build them a house on a little annex of the ground so that they have a place to live later on down the road. Make sure that they're taken care of always in a growing, loving relationship. That's reconciliation. Reconciliation isn't the same as being saved. And God's plan from all along was for us to be reconciled to him to be brought back into a relationship with him. Because as brother, or Pastor Sam said a minute ago, we were enemies of God prior to our salvation. We were at war with him. You don't believe me? You don't have to turn there. I'll turn there real quick. I'm just going to read this passage. Or you could believe me. That would be good too. But in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, uh, Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, in the spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, our manner of life, in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. Prior to salvation, we were at war with God. And that's what Paul's talking about here with this reconciliation stuff in the fifth chapter of Romans. And what it encapsulates and what it entails is truly amazing. It's wonderful. And he lays it all out in the verses prior to that, starting at verse 1. We're going to look through some of these things that took place because of our being reconciled, being brought back into a relationship with him. You know what I mean? And the first thing that we notice in chapter 1, 
or chapter 5, verse 1, is that we can have peace, real peace, peace between us and God. You know, and this world is crazy, and there's bombings that happen all the time. There's, you know, terrorist stuff. There's this tension, and it seems like it's chaos everywhere you go. But ultimately, because we have been reconciled, we can have true peace because there is peace between us and God. We are now in a new family dynamic as children of his. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. I mean, it's great to be saved, but it's a lot better to be adopted, to be reconciled, to be brought back together. And that's why he says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we look around this world, and I know I'm short on time, so I'm going to talk fast. And we see people always looking to find peace. They might not come right out and say that's what they're doing, but that's what they're doing. They want the big bank account, so in case something goes wrong, you know, financially, they're safe. They want, you know, a companion so that they don't have to worry about being alone and they can feel comfortable and that will bring them peace. Or they buy the toys, the cars, the whatever, all these things, trying to find peace. But every person who is apart from God is at enmity with him. It's a spiritual warfare thing. I mean, that's why Paul wrote in Romans 8, 7 that the carnal mind is at enmity with God because it truly is. And those things might provide a little relief, but they will never bring the peace that we have being reconciled to God, being brought back into a relationship. The fact that we are no longer the object of God's wrath is a wonderful, wonderful thing. As it says in Romans 9, or verse 9 of the same chapter, it says, much more than being now justified by the blood, we shall be saved. Where we were enemies, we are now reconciled in verse 10. Men's sins, our sins, my sins, no matter how grievous or bad they were, are no longer imputed on us. Christ paid it all. He took on the penalty that I should have in order to me, for me to be reconciled to God. That is an incredible thing when you think about it. God's peace, just knowing that he loves me and that we're in this relationship. One author called it and said, he said, it brings that sweet quietness to our souls, knowing that we have peace with God, that we are no longer his enemies. And it truly does. It truly does. But how is it that we have this peace? It's through our standing with him. And at this time, being saved and reconciled, we are now standing in grace. Verse 2 reads as follows, But whom also we have access by faith into his grace. We have been introduced to our salvation through grace. It is for by grace you are saved through faith. And is that same grace, Christ's death, made possible so that we could have access to the Father. Everyone has access to God now because of God's grace. That's why on, East, the, on Good Friday, the veil of the temple was torn apart to let any who would be willing to step through come through. There are no outsiders when it comes to God and those who choose to accept. There is no one who he would say no to, turn away, or refuse. Faith is needed for salvation, but is God's grace that saves, not human effort. And that is a wonderful thing, because I get, I, you don't know me as well as I know me, trust me. If it was up to me to get me saved, it would never happen. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, that's what it is. And that's what we have, being reconciled. And we stand in it. It says right there in the verse, it says that we are wherein we stand. It's a permanent position, irrevocable. We are ultimately in the sphere of his grace. That same grace that saved us continues to cleanse us from the sins, from the mistakes, and there is nothing that we can do to change that. our position with God. Where, grace, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. That same grace is like a waterfall just pouring over us. It's just drenching us constantly, you know, in such a wonderful way, an unimaginable way, an incomprehensible way, the grace was. It was what, what did Arthur call it? Amazing grace. The amazing grace of God 
reconciling us continually. Because of Christ, Christians can eagerly anticipate the time when they will share in God's glory because of grace. In contrast of how we kind of fall short now, one day, ultimately, that we will see the fulfillment of God's plan. Not only have we been, recon through reconciliation, we have peace and standing in the presence of him through his grace and the position that he put us in, but we have the hope of a future glory. Look in that same verse, it continues to say, wherein we stand and we rejoice in the hope and the glory, our future glory, you know? This is pretty, this is pretty awesome because, you know, we go through life, I go through life, and life gets lifey sometimes and stuff happens. And it's not always good stuff. Sometimes it's stuff that's really negative and can really bring us down or really make us feel despair or feel like there's like no hope. But being reconciled to God guarantees us a future hope that is going to be so much better than this present world we're living in. We are ultimately going to be with him in his presence, truly seeing him, and we will ultimately be spending an eternity before this awesome God who wanted us, who loved us, who cared for us. And I don't know about you, we go through trials and tribulations, that's why the, Paul continued on to say, we have this glory, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation work is patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope makes us not ashamed, you know? And things will happen, they will but we can still rejoice in the future hope. And you're saying, well, you know, I don't understand, Greg. You know, right now I'm going through this tough time and I don't feel like I can really rejoice in much. It's like the electric bill needs paid and I don't have the money. Well, rejoice that you're not Pico. I don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there is always an opportunity to rejoice when we have this future glory that we're going to be in. When we are standing before God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who telleth the number of stars and calls them by name. That is our future. And the future is looking pretty bright. You know, I don't know when he's coming back. I mean, if he comes and raptures us out of here right now, I won't, that'd be great. But even if I live another 50, 60 years and it's through the grave that I go home to be in glory with him, it's going to be a much better deal than what I got going on now because I will be with my Heavenly Father. Believers can enjoy with peace with God that has been achieved through our reconciliation and the glorious future in God's presence, which awaits. It's waiting for us. We need to keep our eyes and our minds and our hearts guarded and focused on what we do have in store for us. And the reason for these things, the reason that we can have peace the reason that we are standing in grace and the reason that we have hopes all comes down to one little word, and that's the word love. That's the reason. It's God's love in verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. The, his love is the impetus, the catalyst. Or, I don't know, I get those mixed up. It's the reason for why we have peace and hope. It's his love, his love that ultimately saved us and is reconciling us. You know, I don't know how your Bibles read, but mine does not read, for the world so loved God that he sent his son to save us. It says that God so loved the world. It was ultimately his love that it was the cause for us to be saved. His desire to be in a relationship with us. And every single believer is now in that relationship we are in a spiritual love affair with God Almighty right now that is eternal, that will never end. Unlike relationships nowadays, like Pastor Sam said, sometimes things happen and we have disputes, we have fights with our friends, our neighbors, co-workers, family. If there's anybody that we fight with, it's family because they know you and you know them and we all strum each other's nerves. Or maybe that's just my house. But, but with God, it's different. We're in this love affair with him that doesn't end, that continually goes higher and higher and higher to the next level, the next level, the next level, and it continues to grow. And the more we know him, the more we know about him, the more we should love him. 
But it is his love that was the thing that started it all out. You know, newly married couples often start out all giggly and bubbly, and then as time goes on, things sort of fade away a little bit. Oh, boy. Ultimately, <laughs> with God, it is not that way. It continues to grow because of his love. He loved us so much that he did what? He sent his son to die for us. When we were, ver chapter, verse 6, powerless. When we were ungodly, verse 6. When we were enemies, verse 10. When we were just plain old sinners, in verse 8. It was his son's sacrifice on Calvary that ultimately was what made us obtain salvation, but it was because of his love. He died for the ungodly. That was his plan for you and for me, to reconcile us. Jesus felt that torturous abandonment of his father while he was on the tree 2,000 years ago so that we can be reconciled. We weren't just saved. We got a lot more than that going on. And that love that God has for us is the just love of an infinitely holy God. That's a lot to think about. It's a beautiful concept. It is what the reason is that we are saved. And not only that we are saved and we are reconciled, but we are guaranteed an eternal destiny with him. Guaranteed. Verses 9 and 10 says this, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall, or yours might read, we will be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were yet enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we will, shall, be saved by his life. It's not a, you may be or you might be. It's you will be. It's a guarantee. Having been saved from the wrath of God is a guarantee because we have now been adopted. We are now in a different dynamic. We're now in a different relationship with God than we were prior to our salvation. Being reconciled binds the believer to Christ, and there is a certainty from the internal damnation and judgment from God because of it. We can have peace because of this. And ultimately, this should bring us great, great joy. That's why it says in verse 11, and not only so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we have now received the reconciliation. So there's no reason for that sad hound dog face to be downtrodden or despaired, to not be overwhelmed with peace and joy is unacceptable. We are in a relationship with God because of his love. And it is, he has given us the guarantee that we will be with him one day. He didn't just pull us out of the hell's fire and that's it. His desire was for us to be brought back into a relationship or brought into a relationship with him. And that's what gives us joy. Since God reconciled the godless enemies to himself, we should enjoy all the fruits of it which include the, pre, the peace, the standing in grace, and everything else I already said. We should enjoy those things. Do we? You know, it said that the greatest pain of all is knowing that God has abandoned us, but God will never abandon us. We will never know what it's like to be abandoned from God, but Christ did. Christ knew what that was like. So why did he do it? For this reason, to reconcile man. The crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ was the greatest crime of all time in all humanity, but it is what brought us from a point of alienation to the point of reconciliation. That's what happened on the cross 2,000 years ago. Why did Christ come? To reconcile man to God. That's it so that we could have peace, so that we could stand in grace, so that we had a future hope because of his love, guaranteeing an eternal home with him forever and ever. That's reconciliation. That's reason to rejoice. That's reason for us to celebrate. That's reasons for us to praise him in good times and bad times, difficult times or not. It does not matter. We have been reconciled, not just saved. There is so much more that we have gotten than just being pulled from the fires of hell.
with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this. The ministry of reconciliation, you bringing people, us, ungodly, lost people, sinners, into a relationship with you. I thank you for this message. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the reminder just to me of how much you love me. I pray and ask that you will continue to bless this service. In Christ's name, amen. We spend so much every day. Time, money, we use up, we waste so much. We spend time and money every day until it's all gone. Precious resources, powerful resources. What if you, what if you reinvested your time into prayer? your resources into support to help us plant churches, prepare leaders, and proclaim the gospel. What if you became a prayer fellowship partner? GOGF has been planting churches, preparing leaders, and proclaiming the gospel throughout the world since 1961. 14 churches on the eastern seaboard, producing weekly radio broadcasts that reach around the globe. We have ministry training in India, Africa, and the Caribbean. Partner with us. Partner with God. Invest in expanding and supporting His kingdom worldwide. Become a prayer fellowship partner. You have the time and resources to make a difference. If, you're, uh, if you have your Bible and you want to follow, uh, follow along with this, you can turn to the um, Gospel of Matthew. We're looking at chapter 1. And right towards the end of that chapter, <clears throat> so chapter 1, it's a very familiar passage. We're looking at uh, verse number 22 through 23. A lot of you certainly heard this before, maybe slightly in a different context that we'll kind of get into a little bit. But if you're there, I'm reading from the, uh, the New King James Version of the Bible. This is Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse number 22 and going through verse 23. The word of the Lord reads as follows. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you so much for everything you've done thus far this, this morning and this afternoon, I should say. We thank you that you are Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, that you are Elohim, the all-powerful creator, that you are, you are Emmanuel, God with us. And that means so much, Lord, to us if we know you, that... You are with us in everything. And Lord, we just ask that you be with us now and just use your spirit, use your word, and use me, Father. Allow me to just begin to think your thoughts and speak your words for what you have for this congregation today. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We ask that your word would go forth and do what only it and your spirit can do. Continue to conform us to the image and likeness of your son. In the matchless name of the awesome, risen Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. The, well, first of all, what am I doing on Good Friday in Matthew 1, right? You know, I mean, like, that's three months ago, Christmas, right? You know, and, um, you know, often we might be. 26, Matthew 26, 27, that's, that's the Good Friday text, right? Jesus getting beaten up and hanging on the cross and everything. The cross is right there, right? You know, And that's all true what he went through on this day, but so much of it goes to echo what Brother Mason said and Brother Greg said that if you go back to the beginning, Adam and Eve in the creation, they knew what it meant that God was with them. And, of course, we all know that was ruined by their disobedience. And they still experienced God after that, but it wasn't the same as it had been before the fall. And if you go through all the 60-plus generations from that time until the time of Jesus, there's a hunger there by man to 
whether we de deny it, agree with it or whatever, we want to have God with us. And we do all these other things to try to replace that at times. And you see people in the Old Testament, you see a little glimpse of those that had a, a special relationship with God. You see with um, Enoch and what, Genesis 5, you see with Noah, you, know, you see that they walked with God, but it still wasn't what they had on the other side of the fall. You see, Moses had a very special relationship because the, what Psalm 103 says that he knew God's ways, but the people only knew his deeds. But even in that, when he asks in Exodus, uh, can I see your glory? God's like, you can't see that. No, no man can see my face and live. You know, I'll show you my whatever that means when God shows his back parts, whatever that means. I don't know if it means what we think it might mean, but obviously he wasn't able to see the fullness of God. And God in the Old Testament often appeared in a whirlwind, and that's kind of scary. I mean, that's a tornado, essentially, you know. Um, he appeared in various ways, a pillar of cloud, fire, and everything, but he was never fully with them like he had been. And just like it was said previously, until in the fullness of time, he, you know what it's about? It's about this. In the fullness of time, from God's perspective, he knew what he was going to do. But obviously, those people who were experiencing that, they were just waiting for someone to come. Now, what's so fascinating is that if you look at every other religion, they have certain kind of dynamics there. They got the, the, the prophetic person that discovers or had this revelation. They have a certain kind of... Um, principles or whatever that they lay down. And I don't care whether it's Muhammad, Buddhist, Confucius, it's all the same. And there are some moral principles. They may be slightly different, but there's still some kind of moral standard there. And it's something you have to live up to to kind of restore yourself with God. The word religion comes from a Latin word, relingari, that means to relink. It is our attempt to reconnect with God. And that doesn't work. And God knew that. So in the fullness of time, which you see in the book of John in the first chapter, right? We know, we've heard it before, even if we don't know exactly where it's from. In the beginning was the word, right? And the word was with God and the word was God. And all things were made by him, right? There was nothing that was made that wasn't made without him. Verse 14 is the key right here. So we established that that logos, that word is God. But now all of a sudden, that word becomes flesh, right? Put on a human suit, stepped out of eternity, right, into time. And not only did God do that, God with us, right, because he's God first, but he dwelt among us. He hung out with us. John, who wrote that, was just blown away by that. You can even see it in his epistle. You know, when, he when you, you see the beginning of 1 John, when he says, that which we have heard, right? I mean, they hung out with Jesus, that which we have, sorry about that, <laughs> that which we have seen. That's what we walk with them, that which we have gazed upon. I mean, they studied him, and they understood that this was God in the flesh, and for as amazing as it would have been, because I'm sure some of you have probably reflected, man, can you imagine have been around the time of Jesus, you know, to see him do this stuff? Do you realize that if you're saved, you actually have more than that? In John 16, Jesus says to them, basically, you know, they're in the upper room and everything. He was like, look, you know, I got to roll out of here, you know. And he essentially says, if I don't go, it's better for me to go because if I don't go, then the helper can't come. I'm going to send the helper, the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit, that, now see, that's God with us. The, the incarnation, Jesus walking on his earth, is God with us. But when that Holy Spirit indwells us and convicts us and leads us into all truth and guides and directs us, that's God with us. And if you're saved, you have that. I kind of wonder if some of us are living like that at times. I'm saying us, you know. And the reason I say is because if you look at the life of Jesus, and just to give you a little overview, we're not going to turn to it, but 
In Luke chapter 4, Jesus comes out of the wilderness as he's tempted by the devil, right? Goes into Nazareth. Nazareth is his hometown, right? He goes into Nazareth and basically goes to church, as was his custom. He sat down, right? He comes in. They hand him the scroll. See, when they had synagogue back then, they had, it was kind of unfortunately sort of like we kind of do things where it kind of gets routine after a while. You come in, you sing the Psalms, and then you're going to recite the Shema, you know, Deuteronomy 6, oh, um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. You should love the Lord with all your heart. And, and see the way I just said it? That's probably how a lot of them started saying it, you know. We should love the Lord, love the Lord, and just you're not even thinking about what you're saying. And then they would read something from the Old Testament, from the um, Book of Moses, from the, the, the Torah, all right? And then they would read something from the prophets, now, that's the point where Jesus steps in here and kind of interrupts their regularly scheduled program because he reads from the same book of Isaiah that this actual prophecy came from when I read in the beginning from uh, Mark, I mean, uh, Matthew chapter 1. He says, he reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Be he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And as he continues to read from what is Isaiah 61, the word says that he sat down. Sat down doesn't mean, I've heard people teach us like, and when he was done, he just sat himself down. That's not what he did. He was really about to teach at that point. That's how they did it in those days. He didn't just, you know, drop the mic and walk away or something like some comedian with his leather on or something, you know. He actually began to teach, and that's when it says their eyes were fixed on him. And he just said, today, in this hearing, this scripture is fulfilled. You know what he's saying? I'm the one. And it was so different than what they would have heard with some other visiting rabbi that would have been... Read, read through that same text and just, well, the, the prophet Elijah 800 years ago, I mean, he prophesied something of a coming Messiah and, oh, we look forward to a time when, and, you know, people, you know, people doing what they're doing now. When is this thing going to be over, you know? And he just said, all that stuff you heard about in the past, all that stuff you look forward to in the future, is here today. It's being fulfilled, and it could be something in your life right now. I didn't come, as some people teach, to teach to preach the gospel to the poor, those that just don't have money. He's talking about the poor in spirit. He's not just confined to some social gospel. He's talking about the poor in spirit, those who, without him, don't have a clue what's going on. When he talks about the captive, you can be in bondage to sin. Now, as Brother Greg alluded, the, the unsaved world is that way, but sometimes we can live the same way. I mean, do we really know that Jesus that was here today on the spot saying, I can change all this? If he's really God, the all creator with us, then why do we limit him? Oh, yeah, you're God, you're the creator, but you can't help me with this little habit I got, this addiction I have over here, you know. And I know you spoke the world into existence, but my marriage, you just don't know my boss, you know. Because that's, we might not verbalize that, but that's how we live. And it's, he is God, Emmanuel, right, God with us. He is God, but he's also God with us. See, the, the God speaks to the all-powerful part, but the with us speaks to the love he has for us and how he desires to be with us. We don't understand, I think, sometimes. Everybody remember the story of the account with Lazarus, John chapter 11? Lazarus is sick. Word gets to Jesus. Lazarus, your friend, is sick. Jesus hangs out instead of going right away. Hangs out for two days, you know. Two days later, it says to his disciples, all right, guys, let's go see Lazarus. He's sick. He's sleeping. Disciples, you know, well, if he's sleeping, Lord, let him rest. You know, feed a cold, starve a fever, let, you know, let him, you know. And Jesus is like, boys, um, Lazarus is dead, you know. But I'm glad this happened so you can really see what's going to happen here. So let's get out of here. So they go. They arrive in Bethany, right, the town of Lazarus. 
you know, Mar Martha comes running, oh, Lord, if you had been here, you know, uh, my brother. But even now, I know God listens to you. That, that's my Martha voice, you know. And, <laughs> but then Jesus' response is so amazing because what's so interesting is that he says, you're going to see your brother. And she just, yes, I know, I'll see him in the resurrection, you know. And that's when he drops what a lot of us don't understand, like, let me tell you something, Martha, like, I'm the resurrection baby, you know. You think it's some event or some future time, but it's all contained right here. And, and speaking of that, I'm also the life. I don't just give life, I am life. There's a difference. And when we begin to understand God that way, we understand, see, that's what the gospel and the power of the gospel is really about. On this Sunday, the young people are going to do something related to the gospel and the four spiritual laws. It's going to be excellent. But a lot of people think it just ends there. That might be your introduction to the gospel. But the gospel applies to every one of us right here in an ongoing way. It's about the power of God. And Jesus demonstrated that in his life, that, that dunamis power, that he had exousia power, actually. I mean, it, it was all type of power to deal with everyday life. And it seems like we kind of forget that sometimes. It's not just about God loves you and do you admit you're a sinner? Yes, I do. You know, and then would you like to say the prayer? And I'm not minimizing that because that is how people are brought into the kingdom. But we kind of think it ends there. The gospel is the power of God, the fullness of everything. And once we get a, a handle on that, I think we're going to be much better off because all those R's that we were talking about today, Jesus came in the flesh, right, to rescue us, right, to, um, what did you do, Brother Mason? <laughs> Redeem us. <Yeah. laughs> That's a long time ago now, you know. <laughs> uh, reconcile us, you know, restore. I mean, he did so much, and it now all comes through that release of the gospel. When when we kind of walk in the way that Jesus walked, nobody's going to have to ask you anything about what you believe. They want to see something on your life that's different. And then they're going to ask, like, what is it about you? You know, like, this boss is driving me crazy. And I know he has to be driving you crazy. And for some reason, you don't seem to be affected. And then that's when you're going to open the door right there and, and tell them, Oh, yeah, it affects me, but I take it to my God. You know, oh, yeah, I mean, this boss, he thinks he wants to fire me, but he doesn't know who my father is, you know. Yeah. It's as simple as that. It's so much that is in this. It's so much, I think, that we miss out on. And if we really knew who this God was, if we just gave him a chance to truly be God and to want him to be with us. Because I know a lot of times, oh, I would like to be with God more. I would like to spend more time, but it's just a busyness. And now I got the kids and I got this new job and all that. And what did he kind of set aside to be with us? It was a lot more than, you know, that, you know, trek that you have to do in on the, on the train or something. You know, he came down from heaven. He came down to give all that up to be with us. And despite what the guy said on TV and everything, he, he, when he lived his life, he lived a life as a poor person, meaning that he came and showed us God, right? <laughs> and as he showed us God, he showed us in a way that, that was so humbling as an example to us. When you see those manger scenes, they're probably not as accurate as they should be. He was born in a very dirty, filthy place. And it's so representative because now he has to dwell, and I'll speak for myself, in my dirty, filthy heart. And as a result, my heart has changed. He takes all that on, and my heart has changed, and now I can be, just like he said, who I am because of Christ alone. That's what the words were about. That was straight up scripture, all of that there, and it's all there for us. That's the power of the gospel. That's what he went to the cross for, and it's everything that was set up to this point too, but 
there's a power that goes way beyond what we understand if we just allow him to be who he wants to be in our life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you so much, Lord. We thank you for the infinite power of who you are. We thank you for, even for your patience with us, Lord, because we sell you short so many times, Lord, and we just don't allow you to be God in your life. So we ask that you would, Father, help us to just let you be God in our life and let you be God with us, with us at all times, not just at the point of salvation, not only when we're in trouble, not when we're struggling, but at all times, Father, in our families, in our classrooms, in everything we're doing, Lord, and just let that be a representative to this dying world as to who the true and living God is. We thank you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.